An Indian Teacher Among Indians by Z. Kalasa My First Day Though an illness left me unable to continue my college course, my pride kept me from returning to my mother. Had she known of my worn condition, she would have said the white man's papers were not worth the freedom and health I had lost by them. Such a rebuke from my mother would have been unbearable, and as I felt then, it would be far too true to be comfortable. Since the winter, when I had my first dreams about red apples, I had been traveling slowly toward the morning horizon. There had been no doubt about the direction in which I wished to go to spend my energies in a work for the Indian race. Thus, I had written my mother briefly, saying my plan for the year was to teach in an eastern Indian school. Sending this message to her in the west, I started at once eastward. Thus I found myself tired and hot in a black veiling of car smoke as I stood wearily on a street corner of an old-fashioned town, waiting for a car. In a few moments more, I should be on the school grounds, where a new work was ready for my inexperienced hand. Upon entering the school campus, I was surprised at the thickly clustered buildings which made it a quaint little village, much more interesting than the town itself. The large trees among the houses gave the place a cool, refreshing shade and the grass a deeper green. Within this large court of grass and trees stood a low green pump. The queer box-like case had a revolving handle on its side, which clanked and creaked constantly. I made myself known and was shown to my room, a small carpeted room with ghastly walls and a ceiling. The two windows, both on the same side, were curtained with heavy muslin yellowed with age. A clean white bed was in one corner of the room and opposite it was a square pine table covered with a black woolen blanket. Without removing my hat from my head, I seated myself in one of the two stiff back chairs that were placed beside the table. For several heartthrobs, I sat still, looking from ceiling to floor, from wall to wall, trying hard to imagine years of contentment there. Even while I was wondering if my exhausted strength would sustain me through this undertaking, I heard a heavy tread stop at my door. Opening it, I met the imposing figure of a stately gray-haired man. With a light straw hat in one hand and the right hand extended for greeting, he smiled kindly upon me. For some reason, I was awed by his wondrous height and his strong square shoulders, which I felt were a finger's length above my head. I was always slight, and my serious illness in the early spring had made me look rather frail and languid. His quick eye measured my height and breadth. Then he looked into my face. I imagined that a visible shadow flitted across his countenance as he let my hand fall. I knew he was no other than my employer. Aha! So you are the little Indian girl who created the excitement among the college orators, he said, more to himself than me. I thought I heard a subtle note of disappointment in his voice. Looking in from where he stood with one sweeping glance, He asked if I lacked anything for my room. As he turned to go, I listened to his step until it grew faint and was lost in the distance. I was aware that my car-smoked appearance had not concealed the lines of pain on my face. For a short moment, my spirit laughed at my ill fortune, and I entertained the idea of exerting myself to make an improvement. But as I tossed my hat off, a leading weakness came over me and I felt as if years of weariness lay like water-soaked logs upon me. I threw myself upon the bed and, closing my eyes, forgot my good intention. A Trip Westward One sultry month I sat at a desk heaped up with work. Now, as I recall it, I wonder how I could have dared to disregard nature's warning with such recklessness. Fortunately, my inheritance of a marvelous endurance enabled me to bend without breaking. Though I had gone to and fro from my room to the office in an unhappy silence, I was watched by those around me. On an early morning, I was summoned to the superintendent's office. For a half hour, I listened to his words, and when I returned to my room, I remembered one sentence above the rest. 
It was this. I'm going to turn you loose to pasture. He was sending me west to gather Indian pupils for the school, and this was his way of expressing it. I needed nourishment, but the midsummer's travel across the continent to search the hot prairies for overconfident parents who would entrust their children to strangers was a lean pasturage. However, I dwelt on the hope of seeing my mother. I tried to reason that a change was a rest. Within a couple of days, I started toward my mother's home. The intense heat and the sticky car smoke that followed my homeward trail did not noticeably restore my vitality. Hour after hour, I gazed upon the country, which was receding rapidly from me. I noticed the gradual expansion of the horizon as we emerged out of the forests into the plains. The great high buildings whose towers overlooked the dense woodlands and whose gigantic clusters formed large cities diminished together with the groves until only little log cabins lay snugly in the bosom of the vast prairie. The cloud shadows which drifted about on the waving yellow of long dried grasses thrilled me like the meeting of old friends. At a small station consisting of a single frame house, with a rickety boardwalk around it, I alighted from the iron horse just 30 miles from my mother and my brother Dawi. A strong hot wind seemed determined to blow my hat off and return me to olden days when I roamed bareheaded over the hills. After the puffing engine of my train was gone, I stood on the platform in deep solitude. In the distance, I saw the gently rolling land leap up into bare hills. At their bases, a broad gray road was winding itself round about them until it came by the station. Among these hills, I rode in a light conveyance with a trusty driver whose unkempt flaxen hair hung shaggy about his ears and his leather neck of reddish tan. From accident or decay, he had lost one of his long front teeth. Though I call him a pale face, his cheeks were of a brick red. His moist blue eyes, blurred and bloodshot, twitched involuntarily. For a long time he had driven through the grass and snow from this solitary station to the Indian village. His weather-stained clothes fitted badly his warped shoulders. He was stooped and his protruding chin, with its tuft of dry flax, knotted as monotonously as did the head of his faithful beast. All the morning I looked about me, recognizing old familiar skylines of rugged bluffs and round-topped hills. By the roadside I caught glimpses of various plants whose sweet roots were delicacies among my people. When I saw the first cone-shaped wigwam, I could not help uttering an exclamation which caused my driver a sudden jump out of his drowsy nodding. At noon, as we drove through the eastern edge of the reservation, I grew very impatient and restless. Constantly, I wondered what my mother would say upon seeing her little daughter grown tall. I had not written her the day of my arrival, thinking I would surprise her. Crossing a ravine thicketed with low shrubs and plum bushes, we approached a large yellow acre of wild sunflowers. Just beyond the nature's garden, we drew near to my mother's cottage. Close by the log cabin stood a little canvas-covered wigwam. The driver stopped in front of the open door, and in a long moment, my mother appeared at the threshold. I had expected her to run out to greet me, but she stood still, all the while staring at the weather-beaten man at my side. At length, when her loftiness became unbearable, I called to her, Mother, why do you stop? This seemed to break the evil moment, and she hastened out to hold my head against her cheek. My daughter, what madness possessed you to bring home such a fellow? She asked, pointing at the driver, who was fumbling in his pockets for a change while he held the bill I gave him between his jagged teeth. Bring him? Why, no, mother, he has brought me. He is a driver, I exclaimed. Upon this revelation, my mother threw her arms about me and apologized for her mistaken inference. We laughed away the momentary hurt. Then she built a brisk fire on the ground in the teepee and hung a blackened coffee pot on one of the prongs of a forked pole which leaned over the flames. Placing a pan on a heap of red embers, she baked some unleavened bread. 
this light luncheon she brought into the cabin and arranged on a table covered with a checkered oilcloth. My mother had never gone to school, and though she meant always to give up her own customs, for such of the white man's ways as pleased her, she made only compromises. Her two windows, directly opposite each other, she curtained with a pink-flowered print. The naked logs were unstained and rudely carved with an axe so as to fit into one another. The sod roof was trying to boast of tiny sunflowers, the seeds of which had probably been planted by the constant wind. As I leaned my head against the logs, I discovered the peculiar odor that I could not forget. The rains had soaked the earth and roof so that the smell of damp clay was but the natural breath of such a dwelling. Mother, why is not your house cemented? Do you have no interest in a more comfortable shelter? I asked, when the apparent inconveniences of her home seemed to suggest indifference on her part. You forget, my child, that I am now old, and I do not work with beads any more. Your brother Dawi, too, has lost his position, and we are left without means to buy even a morsel of food. She replied, Dawi was a government clerk in our reservation when I last heard from him. I was surprised upon hearing what my mother said concerning his lack of employment. Seeing the puzzled expression on my face, she continued, Dawi, oh, has he not told you that the great father at Washington sent a white son to take your brother's pen from him. Since then, Dawi has not been able to make use of the education the Eastern School has given him. I found no words with which to answer satisfactorily. I found no reason with which to cool my inflamed feelings. Dawi was a whole day's journey off on the prairie, and my mother did not expect him until the next day. We were silent. When, at length, I raised my head to hear more clearly the moaning of the wind in the corner logs, I noticed the daylight streaming into the dingy room through several places where the logs fitted unevenly. Turning to my mother, I urged her to tell me more about Dawi's trouble, but she only said, Well, my daughter, this village has been these many winters a refuge for white robbers. The Indian cannot complain to the Great Father in Washington without suffering outrage for it here. Dawi tried to secure justice for our tribe in a small matter, and today you see the folly of it. Again, though she stopped to hear what I might say, I was silent. My child, there is only one source of justice and I have been praying steadfastly to the Great Spirit to avenge our wrongs, she said, seeing I did not move my lips. My shattered energy was unable to hold longer any faith, and I cried out desperately, Mother, don't pray again. The Great Spirit does not care if we live or die. Let us not look for good or justice. Then we shall not be disappointed. Shh, my child. Do not talk so madly. There is Taku Iotan Wasaka, to which I pray, she answered, as she stroked my head again, as she used to do when I was a smaller child. My Mother's Curse Upon White Settlers One black night, Mother and I sat alone in the dim starlight in front of our wigwam. We were facing the river as we talked about the shrinking limits of the village, she told me about the poverty-stricken white settlers who lived in caves dug in the long ravines of the high hills across the river. A whole tribe of broad-footed white beggars had rushed hither to make claims on those wild lands. Even as she was telling this, I spied a small glimmering light in the bluffs. That is a white man's lodge where you see the burning fire, she said. Then, a short distance from it, only a little lower than the first, was another light. As I became accustomed to the night, I saw more and more twinkling lights here and there scattered all along the wide black margin of the river. Still looking toward the distant firelight, my mother continued, My daughter, beware of the pale face. It was the cruel pale face who caused the death of your sister and your uncle, 
my brave brother. It is this same pale face who offers in one palm the holy papers and, with the other, gives a holy baptism of fire water. He is the hypocrite who reads with one eye, Thou shalt not kill, and, with the other, gloats upon the sufferings of the Indian race. Then, suddenly discovering a new fire in the bluffs, she exclaimed, Well, well, my daughter, there is the light of another white rascal. She sprang to her feet, and standing firm beside her wigwam, she sent a curse upon those who sat around the hated white man's light. Raising her right arm forcibly into line with her eye, she threw her whole might into her doubled fist as she shot it vehemently at the strangers. Long she held her outstretched fingers toward the settler's lodge, as if an invisible power passed from them to the evil at which she aimed. Retrospection Leaving my mother, I returned to the school in the east. As months passed over me, I slowly comprehended that the large army of white teachers in Indian schools had a larger missionary creed than I had suspected. It was one which included self-preservation quite as much as Indian education. When I saw an opium eater holding a position as teacher of Indians, I did not understand what good was expected until a Christian in power replied that this pumpkin-colored creature had a feeble mother to support. An inebriate paleface sat stupid in a doctor's chair while Indian patients carried their ailments to untimely graves because his fair wife was dependent upon him for her daily food. I find it hard to count that white man, a teacher who tortured an ambitious Indian youth by frequently reminding the brave changeling that he was nothing but a government pauper. Though I burned with indignation upon discovering on every side instances no less shameful than those I have mentioned, there was no present help. Even the few rare ones who have worked nobly for my race were powerless to choose workmen like themselves. To be sure, a man was sent from the Great Father to inspect Indian schools, but what he saw was usually the student's sample made for exhibition. I was nettled by this sly cunning of the workmen who hook-winked the Indian's pale father at Washington. My illness, which prevented the conclusion of my college course, together with my mother's stories of the encroaching frontier settlers, left me in no mood to strain my eyes in searching for latent good in my white co-workers. At this stage of my own evolution, I was ready to curse men of small capacity for being the dwarfs their God had made them. In the process of my education, I had lost all consciousness of the nature world about me. Thus, when a hidden rage took me to the small white-walled prison, which I then called my room, I unknowingly turned away from my one salvation. Alone, in my room, I sat like the petrified Indian woman of whom my mother used to tell me. I wished my heart's burden would turn me to unfeeling stone, but alive, in my tomb, I was destitute. For the white man's papers, I had given up my faith in the Great Spirit, for these same papers, I had forgotten the healing in trees and brooks. On account of my mother's simple view of life and my lack of any, I gave her up also. I made no friends among the race of people I loathed. Like a slender tree, I had been uprooted from my mother, nature, and God. I was shorn of my branches, which had waved in sympathy and love for home and friends. The natural coat of bark, which had protected my oversensitive nature, was scraped off to the very quick. Now, a cold bare pole I seemed to be planted in a strange earth. Still, I seemed to hope a day would come when my mute aching head, reared upward to the sky, would flash a zigzag lightning across the heavens. With this dream of vent for a long pent consciousness, I walked again amid the crowds. At last, one weary day in the schoolroom, a new idea presented itself to me. It was a new way of solving the problem of my inner self. I liked it. Thus, I resigned my position as teacher, and now I am in an eastern city following the long course of study I have set for myself. 
Now, as I look back upon the recent past, I see it from a distance as a whole. I remember how, from morning till evening, many specimens of civilized peoples visited the Indian school. The city folks with canes and eyeglasses, the countrymen with sunburnt cheeks and clumsy feet, forgot their relative social ranks in an ignorant curiosity. Both sorts of these Christian pale faces were alike astounded at seeing the children of savage warriors so docile and industrious. As answers to their shallow inquiries, they received the student's sample work to look upon, examining the neatly figured pages and gazing upon the Indian girls and boys bending over their books. The white visitors walked out of the schoolhouse well satisfied. They were educating the children of the red man. They were paying a liberal fee to the government employees in whose able hands lay the small forest of Indian timber. In this fashion, many have passed idly through the Indian schools during the last decade, afterward to boast of their charity to the North American Indian. But few there are who have paused to question whether real life or long-lasting death lies beneath this semblance of civilization. End of Section 3